Happy Fourth of July, TPC! Thank you for spending your morning with us. Thank you for being here and pushing your festivities just a little bit further into the day. So we're gonna celebrate this morning. We're gonna celebrate freedom physically and spiritually, emotionally, all of it um, here in the house of God. Because true freedom comes from him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord, everyone. Aren't you glad we can worship God in freedom this morning? I just got a few quick announcements for you. This coming Tuesday is prayer meeting at 7 p.m., so if you're available, please come spend some time with us in doing so. And also, Sunday, July 11th from 4 to 6 p.m., that's next Sunday, we're going to have a Bible reading of 1 and 2 Corinthians. If you would like, there's a sign-up sheet in the four-year list there, or you can see Brother Scott for details. And then July 24th, there's going to be a crew garage sale at the annex. So if you got some things that you're thinking about, you want to get rid of, that's not trash, that you were going to throw away, please see Sister Alexa for details, but save the good stuff, I suppose. And we're going through the mind, body, spirit this year. And this month, we're going to be hopefully stimulating our mind so maybe pick up a book or go on an excursion with TPC Saturday, July 31st. You might want to mark this in your calendar. We're going to be taking a trip into the past at the Steamboat Arabia Museum in Kansas City. See Scott for more details. Pastor says it's pretty awesome, and I'm looking forward to it. 
Our offering designation is for Bibles for the jail, the county jail. We'd like to raise some money to get them some Bibles. Obviously, they're in some critical, desperate situations. Those guys are and girls, so we'd like to support them and help them get some good resources. I believe that's all I got for announcements. Sister Susie's going to come lead us in prayer. God bless you. All right, as Stephen mentioned, we're focusing on the mind this month, so that's what our prayer focus is going to um, be focused on as well. And I was thinking of the story of Elijah that you can find in 1 Kings 19. So if you didn't pick up one of these slips, make sure you get one on your way out today. Um, this was an incredible story of the prophet Elijah who had just finished on Mount Carmel. You remember he poured water on the sacrifice, the Lord consumed his sacrifice, and all of the prophets of Baal had been killed. This incredible victory. And in the very next chapter, we find that Queen Jezebel is so angry at him that she says, I'm going to come kill you. And what is his reaction after he has done this most incredible thing? He has seen the action of the Lord, and his first instinct is, I'm so afraid, and he takes off running. And so through, we're going to be praying all month long through this story of Elijah and what happens to him. And so this week, I want us to apply that to us, that whenever we have victory that comes into our life, that fear would not be the next thing that follows it. Because sometimes what happens when the Lord does something good for you, you think, oh, but this can't last. There, there's no way this can't last. Or here's a good thing, but okay, what's the next bad thing that's going to happen? Have you ever done that? Or maybe I know sometimes I've gotten to the point, too, after you've gotten several bad phone calls in a row, you start when your phone rings, you start getting really nervous. Like, what's next? Something bad has to happen. And you're just always waiting for the next bad thing to happen. So we want to release our minds of that. We don't want fear to follow the victories that the Lord has given to us. So for this week, for your mind, and pray for the people in this church and for our communities, that we could just live in victory. We could just live in the freedom that the Lord has given to us and not have to have that victory mixed with any kind of fear. Then today, we want to continue praying for Olivia, who is here today, has been having a lot of issues with her um, ears and just allergy kinds of things, but really very severely. So we want to continue praying for her. Pray for Sister Patty Dodd, um, needs continued healing. Uh, we prayed for a little girl named Issa. She um, was the girl we had mentioned who has um, had severe seizures all of her life. Um, she has had surgery on her brain and is recovering, so we want to continue praying for her. Harold, it's good to see you today. Want to continue praying for you. Savannah has also asked. She also is having issues with her ears. Uh, so we want to just pray for her that the Lord would touch her. And I want you to just pray that the Lord would maybe bring somebody to your mind that you could um, reach out to this week. We have a lot of people who have suffered loss and difficult things recently. Um, some of them are here with us today, and some of them might not be here. And so I just want you to ask that the Lord would help you think of somebody who maybe just needs a little extra encouragement and reach out to them this week. Pray for them right now if they come to your mind, and then pray for them throughout the week. And let's just be a blessing to somebody else so we're not just focused on ourselves and our own mind and our own struggles, but that we would reach out to somebody else as well. So let's, if you would, stand with me this morning. Let's take these needs to the Lord. If you want somebody to pray for you in your body, please feel free to come forward. Pastor is here. He'd be happy to pray for you. And I believe the Lord can touch and heal your body. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you are so good and so kind. Lord, you have given us great freedom. Lord, we are thankful for all that you have given to us, all that comes from your hand, Lord. There is goodness that comes from you, and we are so thankful. Lord, we're thankful that you have good things in store for us and a good future planned for us. And victory, Lord Jesus, that does not have to come with fear. Lord, I thank you today that you are our healer and you are able, Lord Jesus, to continue to minister to those who need healing in their body, Lord, like Olivia and Patty, for Isa, Lord Jesus, for Harold and Savannah, Lord Jesus, right now with your sweet healing touch. 
I thank you for letting your anointing flow. Let it flow from the throne, Lord. We have all been recipients of that healing touch. And there's nothing like it when your healing virtue comes to touch our bodies. Lord, you know those who are suffering and hurting today. I thank you for ministering to them with a spirit of compassion, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for giving them just what they need. Walk with them a little closer today, Lord Jesus. Let them hear your voice. We give you all of the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. You may be seated as we continue to worship. So we did um, the acoustic set for our Praise in the Park back in May. We had so many people that were just like, oh my goodness, that was so beautiful. <laughs> Can we do that again? Um, and so we're like, you know what? Let's just work that in once a quarter, every once in a while, and just have just a really stripped down acoustic set for worship. So here we are. Um, it's a perfect day to do that today. Um, bringing in second quarter's acoustic set. So enjoy this. It's a little bit quieter for apostolics. Shocker. Not as loud. There's no bass. There's no crazy drums. But the spirit of the Lord is the same. <laughs> um, it's a little different format. So don't sit. Enjoy. Um, enjoy something a little different. And, and expand your worship palette. <laughs>
Father, how great is our God? It's all good. We'll do the God great job. Acoustic sets are also choose your own adventure. Oh, 
hands. I love it. Time is in his hands. Your beginning and your end and every spot in between is every bit of it's in his hands today. Oh, thank God. Can you just give him one more praise? He's so worthy. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thousand stories of a world. 
It was a dark, dark night. And he didn't come with a hand of judgment. He didn't come with a condemnation or a word, a condemning word to me or a, a finger shaking in my face. It was with a whisper of love. It was a, hey, sweetheart, <laughs> it's okay. It was a daddy kind of moment. And if you've had those moments, those really intimate, just special moments with the Lord, you know him differently than other people do. And so you can say he's a good father because he showed up. He was the safety that I needed. He was the grace that I needed. Wednesday night, we talked a lot about grace. And he is that good father their moment, that whisper of love in the dead of night. If you haven't experienced that with him, I'd encourage you. Find out who Jesus really is. More than anything, he's love. More than anything, he's grace. And he's this beautiful, quiet voice. He wasn't in the storm. He wasn't in the big boom. Sometimes he's in the wild. And that's where sometimes we need him the most. As we sing this this next time, just why don't you just close your eyes and lift a hand and however your spirit reacts. I'm a crier. I cry. I cry on sad movies. I cry on commercials. And I cry in the presence of the Lord. However your spirit reacts to him, let him whisper to you.
It's who I am. It's who I am. And you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. Yes, you're perfect. So grateful. So grateful. Praise the Lord, everybody. Happy Fourth of July. I'm going to, at this time, dismiss our kids back to kids' church. Thankful that they're able to come out here and worship with us during this time. It's so good to have you in the house of God on this beautiful day. Amen. All right. All right. I want to say welcome to Chris's mom, Rita. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being with us today. For all those that are joining us online this morning, thank you for joining us. I want to reiterate something that Susie was sharing with us about the fear that grips our mind after, after victory and how important it is that we are in the right frame of mind and that we we don't let ourselves just because we have a great victory doesn't mean that you you lose sight and statistically most people backslide and this is there's been different studies done on this and the statistics that they have discovered is most people backslide on a monday you think about that you go to church you have great church you have great victory on sunday but it's when you've let your guard down because you've had the victory and because you've had success and whatever. I, I think it's just something important in what she had said about how we don't need to let fear grip our minds and that we need to be very cognizant of that. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the Word of the Lord at this time, and I hope to share something with you today that might inspire you, might challenge you, might well, do something for you, hopefully. Uh, how many is going to preach with me? Because here's the deal. I know there's people that can get up and they can just do this, whether you're with them or not. They can just make it happen. I'm not that guy. Uh, and so if you're not with me, then I struggle. And if I struggle, you struggle. So uh, let's all stand together. Grab your Bibles if you have it. No struggles today. Amen. First Chron I'm going to read three verses of Scripture, and I'm jumping all over the place. First Chronicles 29, 11. 
Colossians 1, 16, and then back over into the Old Testament again to Job chapter 37. What does that tell you? It means pastor couldn't make up his mind. That's what that means. And so 1 Chronicles 29, 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory. Going down the list here. Hey, it's good to see the Pratts in the house today. Man, I just now put that together. He snuck in here. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. I mean, is there anything else you can put into that list? I don't think so. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Colossians 1.16 for by him were all things created that are in heaven and are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is, a, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have, might have the preeminence. And then Job chapter 37, verse 14, it says, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. On this amazing day that we are about to celebrate, this 4th of July holiday, that we have inherited by the willing braveness of people who are willing to lay down their lives for an idea, for an idea that we would be one nation, under God. And I want to remind us that all freedom comes from God. All freedom, all kinds of freedom comes from God. He is the original source of it all. And as long as we remain under God, then we can enjoy that freedom. And for just a few minutes, I want to talk to you on this subject from stars to stripes. From stars to two stripes. Let's pray before we're seated. Lord, we thank you for your help today. Thank you for the power of your spirit that is in this place this morning. Lord, we've gathered here together. Lord, we have worshiped you. We have sang about your greatness. We have sang about your majesty. We've sang about how great of a father and a provider and a way maker and a peace speaker you have been. I'm thanking you, God, in advance for what it is you're going to release into us today. We come here with an attitude of gratitude this morning as we gather around your word in Jesus name. God bless you. You may be seated. I have behind me two flags. One is the Christian flag if you're not familiar with that. And then also something you should definitely for sure be familiar with and that is the American flag to my right to your left. The 50 stars on the flag of the United States of America's flag represents the 50 states, and those 13 stripes of red and white represent the 13 British colonies that declared independence from the kingdom of Great Britain back when, and they became the first states in the United States of America. And so the flag was then nicknamed the Stars and Stripes. Stars themselves represent much more than the 50 states, but the vastness of what is known in the universe above us. Many cultures throughout history have attributed stars to, to the divine because they appear faithfully in the sky. They appear steadfastly in the sky. They give you direction, and yet they are unattainable. That to them made them divine works of God. Several of our astronauts who have gone and returned from space have said that there has got to be a God behind all of this. In fact, during the Apollo 8 mission, members of that team declared that there has got to be something bigger than science that has put all this together, including ourselves. Another said that the wonder of creation itself tells us that there has got to be a creator. There's got to be a God. It is my desire today to try to put into some kind of context for us, to give you some kind of a minute little glimpse as to how awesome of a God that you serve today. He truly is an awesome God. Does anybody believe that this morning? 
He is awesome. Sir James Jean, a British astrologer, said it this way. He said, it seems to me that the universe has been created by a mathematician, for we are reminded over and over that God planned everything down to the minute little detail. In fact, even the slant of the earth, which is angled at 23 degrees, which produces our seasons. It's something to behold. It's something to consider. Science tells us that if the Earth's axis would move even one degree, water from the oceans would move north and south, piling up huge continents of ice. If our moon was only 50,000 miles away from the Earth instead of its original now 200,000 miles away, the tides of our oceans would be so large that they would cover everything on the earth at least twice a day. Imagine that the oceans would cover the earth every day, twice a day, but God planned it all down to the smallest little detail, and that's why he is truly Lord over all the heaven and Lord over all the earth. Science tells us that the estimated weight of the earth, it's an estimated number, but the estimated weight of the earth is 6 trillion tons. That's pretty heavy. 6 trillion tons, but yet it rests upon an invisible axis that allows it to spin at the rate of a 1,000 miles an hour through outer space. Job said it this way, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. That invisible axis that this world rests upon and continues to rotate upon is called the Word of God. The Word of God put it there, and the Word of God is what keeps it there. I'm here to tell you the Word of God is something of power, the word of God is something of relevance. The word of God is something that we need to hold fast to because it's the word of God that come to you, that saved your soul. It's the word of God that keeps you. It's the word of God that keeps the universe. Where would we be without his word? God said, let there be, and it was, and it has been unto this very day. It still is. Our world rotates around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour as we just set upon it here this morning. You don't feel like you're moving that fast, do you? The reason is is because gravity holds you to it. Every 23 hours, 59 minutes, and one fourteenth of a second, our earth makes its revolution around the sun, and it has never deviated from its course since the day that God said, you do this. Imagine that. The God that created all the universe gave his word to something, and there it is. If the earth would stop spinning around the sun, it would become a solid block of ice. God is an awesome God. He is Lord over every little thing. Things that we don't even think about, God's Lord over that. Things that we do think about, God's also Lord over that as well. God has set into motion all the planets in our solar system that revolve around the sun. You know, continue... Continue this, this thinking about the sun. The sun, of, the sun is a, a star in which it has a core temperature of 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, and yet the earth, we are told, only absorbs one trillionth of its heat energy. So when you're out mowing the grass and the sun's bearing down on you and it is hot, and trust me, it gets hot, imagine that is only one trillionth of the heat energy that is at the surface of the sun. That's pretty hot, my friend, and God's in control of all that. When we try to comprehend all of what we see in the heavens above, including the stars, I can't help to even begin to turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26, where it says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for he that is strong in power, not one faileth. It is estimated that there is one quintillion stars in the universe around us. Think about one quintillion I mean, that's a lot. I don't even know where a quintillion is in the lineup. I, I, I get to a trillion. I get, you know, you got million, billion, trillion, and, and I don't know where it goes. It's like octillion, quintillion, sectillion, octillion. I don't know how many trillions there is, but God's in control of every one of it. To think about that, that God knows the host of the stars by name. 
and he created all that. It, it, th that means that God has an amazing memory. God's memory is as good as his faithfulness. God has never forgotten to cause the sun to shine or the rain to fall. He's never forgotten to bring about the seasons of the year, year after year, century after century. And if God can remember the names of countless stars, and if God can remember to bring the seasons to fruition every year, day in and every year after year after year for centuries, then tell me, my friend, what makes you think that somehow God can forget about you where you are today? what you're dealing with this morning, what you woke up with today. God knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. And when the Word of God tells me that he has numbered the hairs on your head, whether they be many or few, God still knows that about you. That's encouraging for me today. I need to calm down. I feel like I'm yelling a lot. God doesn't know what memory failure is. My God is faithful to all his creation, especially to the pinnacle of his creation, which is you and I. There's something about us that is special. You need to know today that the Lord of the stars knows exactly where you are in your little finite world today. He knows where you're at. He knows what exactly you're going through. And if you'll hold on and be faithful to God who is faithful to you, he'll bring you through whatever it is that you're dealing with this morning. I promise you that. You have an awesome God that is for you. And if God is for you, who, what could possibly be against you? What circumstance, what enemy, what sickness, what disease? There's nothing that is too great for the Lord. There's nothing too great for God because he's God of the universe. He's the Lord over the stars. He, is, he, he can handle it, and that's the God that you have at your disposal today. You serve an awesome God this morning who knows where you're at, and he knows what you're going through. The spirit of the most holy God, the Lord of creation, the commander of the celestial, the one who has numbered the stars and then also named them, he would come down and he would overshadow a Hebrew girl and from her womb would bring forth a sinless sacrifice and that every one of us would one day need to believe in to be saved from our sins. We know him as Jesus Christ. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying I've come here to tell somebody today that the Lord of the stars would also become Lord of your stripes. I'm talking about stars and stripes today, but I'm not talking about the flag behind me. I'm talking about God's colors. Our God won for us the ultimate form of freedom, and that is the freedom from sin and death, my friend. The Lord of the stars became the Lord of our stripes because he knew that he alone would be the only ultimate source of true freedom for you and I today. He who, who commanded the stars also commanded the stripes upon his own back. Think about that. He loved you so much that he was willing to go to a cross on Calvary for you and I this morning. And I'm sorry, but that, my friend, is something to bring to remembrance today. We call the flag old glory. But I want you to know that the God of eternal glory has made a way for us to enter into that glory that hope that we have is called heaven. And that, my friend, is brought to us by the work of salvation. Salvation is the flag that flies inside of our own heart that nobody can take away. Nobody can burn that flag for you. Nobody can take that flag and defame that flag. But that flag, my friend, is something that flies in the, your heart this morning because you have a flag that is flown high from the castle of your heart. And that's why, because because the king is in residence there. There's something about his flag that makes all the difference to us today. When you look at this flag behind me, you need to be reminded that it was built upon the ultimate idea. And that ultimate idea is that each individual has a divine spark inside of them from the God of all creation. And that we are better together under one God than we are under any king or queen of this earth. 
There's only one king, and his name is Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9 and 6 tells us this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. That word wonderful means beyond ordinary, or sometimes, or, or really it sometimes means something that transcends the known when you call something wonderful, you have to understand what you're saying. It, you're, you're telling whatever it is you're attributing wonderful to that it is beyond what is even can be understood or known. So maybe you might not want, want to call somebody wonderful. Uh, really, Isaiah kind of really encapsulated it best because he called God wonderful. And so God truly is wonderful. Everything you know about Christ is, is out of the ordinary. It transcends what we can even begin to know him. Just even through his word, he goes beyond that. Uh, everything about him transcends our known world. Whoever ever thought of a baby being born without the union of a man and a woman? That's, that's out of the ordinary. Uh, so whenever you think about who Jesus is and even how he got here, that, my friend, transcends what we know to be normal. It transcends the known of what we understand. And so even his, his ascension into the realm of our, our earthly atmosphere is in itself wonderful. Jesus' ministry was transcendent. Never had there been a man who could touch the, the leper and he would be made whole. Never was there a man who could touch the lame and the blind and they would be healed and made whole. Never was there a man who could speak to death and those who were dead would be raised back again to life. There was nothing ordinary about this man. Everything about Jesus was beyond common. He was Mary's God who became Mary's baby who became Mary's Savior. <laughs> Some of y'all get on board with me this morning. He was the creator who became the created, who became the sinless sacrifice for all of us today. He was the Father who became the Son, who is the Holy Ghost that lives inside of us this morning. There's only one of him, and he is all three in one. No, no wonder Isaiah said that his name would be called Wonderful. He truly is wonderful. Stars and stripes were God's idea long before the United States of America ever got a hold of it. I, I wonder, is there anyone in this place this morning whose life has been touched by the stars and stripes of heaven's glory this morning? I, I've been touched by those stars and those stripes, and I'm thankful for them today. I'm not talking about this flag this morning, which is the highest form of man's idea of freedom. It represents that. It represents what America stands for. I'm talking about the divine light of the gospel this morning that pierced your dark world and brought peace and healing in your life because of the stripes that were upon Jesus' back. God did that because he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life this morning. Every time I read in the scripture that God spoke to someone, he never called them out by number, although he did number his creation. The Bible tells us that. He always called them not by number but by name. That tells me God knows you. God knows you. God knows where you are. He knows what makes you up. <laughs> He knows what makes you happy. He knows also what makes you sad. He knows what is troubling you, even probably even today. He knows what your future holds. God never failed to remember those in the scripture that we read. Specifically, you think about Daniel. God remembered Daniel in the den of lions. He never forgot the name of Joseph whenever he spent 13 years in an Egyptian prison. 
system. He, he never forgot about Elijah down by the brook Cherith after he was running from Jezebel and, or, and, and all that craziness. He, he never forgot about those things. He never, he never forgot them. He never forgot about Jonah down in the belly of a whale. He never forgot to remember Job in his affliction. He never failed to remember Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. God for, never forgot them. And for us to think for a second that God would forget us, us, that God would somehow forget about where we are and what we're going through. The truth is God knows where you're at. He knows what you need. He knows where you are, and he knows how to get you what you need today. Just <clears throat> as much as I'm glad to have a God that remembers me, I'm also glad to have a God who forgets some things. You say, well, pastor, that's a contradiction. You just said that God doesn't ever forget. He doesn't ever forget. The only time that our God ever fails to remember something is whenever we repent of our sins and we're buried in baptism in his name. And the only way that he can possibly even forget that is because he chooses to. We have a God who has the ability to forgive and truly forget. We have a God who has ordained this universe, and if you allow him, he'll order your steps as well. God is a master planner, and I believe God wants to plan your life today if you'll let him. Will you, will you let God have that liberty this morning? Will you let him plan your day? There's something about whatever God gets a hold of my, my, my schedule. When God takes control over what it is that I have planned, he does more with less than what I do with a lot. And that's why it's important for us to surrender to him every single day. When the framers of the foundational document of the Declaration of Independence wrote that government shall be established to ensure safety and happiness, I, I don't believe it was a mistake that they put one nation under God in our currency. They put it on our currency. They put it on our flag. They put it on anything, many things that we would come into contact with. You know, our eyes would see it. Our ears would hear it. Those things, one nation under God. It's in our pledge. It's in our, it's all over the nation today. We are one nation truly under God. That's the way we were founded. That's the way we were constructed. And it's important for us to remember that and never forget that. They understood that one nation under God was more than just a catchy little phrase, but that it was a standard from which this nation was born and would continue to grow as long as it remained one nation under him. They knew that to ensure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, that this independent nation would have to be reminded of our dependence on God. It's one thing to say you're independent, but you're not independent unless you're first dependent on him. Because liberty steps into the picture the moment we surrender to his lordship and his authority. You cannot celebrate independence without acknowledging, de acknowledging dependence upon God. For where would we be if it had not been for him? Where would we be today? You can't celebrate that without acknowledging what God has done for you. Every one of us has a past that we are either trying to escape this morning or maybe have been delivered from. And I'm talking about some kind of oppression perhaps that was upon you that had you bound, but God stepped into your life and proved what his word declared, that he who the Son has set free is truly free indeed. I wonder, is there some people that know what true liberty is? feels like, what true liberty and true freedom feels like. I'm talking about the liberty that we have whenever we're forgiven of our past. There are some truly free people in this place today. I don't know about you, but I want to be involved in what God is doing in these last days. Matthew 12, 30, Jesus says it like this. He says, he that is not with me is against me. And here's the thing that you need to understand this morning, and I hope I bring it, making this point clear, is that all the middle ground is vanished. 
If there was middle ground in living for the Lord, I believe it's going. <laughs> There's no gray area with him. That you're either with him or you're against him. In order to understand some of the problems we are facing, we have to get ourselves in, into the, the, the mindset that there is no neutral zone with God. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either helping me gather or you're scattering what I'm trying to accomplish. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And I want to expose to you what I feel is the greatest spiritual warfare that we are facing today in the church. And in order to understand the greatest problem facing the church today, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the problem with carnality today? What is the problem with lukewarmness? And what is the basis of backsliding in the church today? You may be surprised whenever I tell you that I don't believe that it's sin. I don't believe it is Satan. I don't believe that it is our society that is causing this. But the greatest problem that we are facing in the church today is boredom. People have become complacent. People have gotten comfortable. People have gotten to a place where they don't feel like they want to challenge even themselves this morning. They are bored with their walk with God. They go to church and they go home. They go to church and they go home. They go to work, they go home. And that is their life in a nutshell. Can I tell you that if we will ever mobilize the kingdom of God, if we would mobilize ourselves, the things that we can accomplish, Accomplish for his kingdom's purpose would absolutely blow our minds. But we got to get motivated. It's our responsibility as believers to rise up out of mediocrity, to break loose from that complacency that I'm talking about, to stand up and to declare whose side you are on. It is time for you. I'm, to, I'm just challenging you this morning. I want to give this challenge to you today. You take it for whatever you think it's worth, and you take it from this place. But it is time for the church to wave its flag to the lost world around it. If we, we've, been, we've been too comfortable, we've gotten too bored with our, our, our living for the Lord that we need to up the ante here. We need to get motivated this morning. We need some forward momentum happening in our walk with God that whenever people come in contact with us, they see the majesty of God, that's the stars, but they also see the mercy of God, which is his stripes. It's our responsibility as believers to rise up out of that place. And I, I believe that it can happen if we would just begin to mobilize this church and we would begin to get uh, out of this state of being that we're just doing church and then we're just living this, this, this existence. But it's so much more than that. We have revival in us. I believe God just wants to get it out of us. That's why God's challenging us this morning to wave the flag of your salvation to the world that needs it most our numbers don't matter the hard, the hardest part of our uh, of this picture is the mobilization of the people getting people mobilized getting people to be motivated it's one of the hardest things i've told you stories about being a photographer for a photo company taking pictures of kids and how hard it was, do you think it'd be easy to make people smile? It's one of the hardest jobs. I mean, I'd rather re-roof a, a hot roof on a hot day than try to make 15 kids smile. It's hard. It's almost impossible. When you think they're supposed to smile, they don't want to smile. It's this mobile, it's this trying to motivate people to smile, that's hard. But you know what's even harder? Getting somebody to do something for the kingdom of God. It's hard. Because you would think people would be so excited about the salvation that they have and the forgiveness that they have and the great things that God is doing for them that they would want to share that with somebody. And sometimes even as a pastor, you feel how hard it is to mobilize people. 
I, if we could just mobilize everybody from the children to the senior citizen, there, that there is nothing that is impossible for the church to accomplish whenever that happens. When we can mobilize and motivate people, this is a great church. Don't get me wrong. This is a great church full of fantastic people who serve a great God. And I believe that if we can get together on any one thing, it doesn't matter what it is. We could just get together on any idea. But if we'll get together on it, that there's something that we can do together that the kingdom of hell cannot fight against it. I believe that we can do whatever it is that we set our hearts and our minds to do. And you must understand that there is no retirement in this battle. As a child of God, you were born onto the battlefield. You wonder where you were born. You weren't born in a hospital. You weren't born at home. You were born on a battlefield. The battlefield I'm talking about is a spiritual battlefield that is called life. You were born on the battlefield, and as an adult, there is nowhere you can go that the battle is not. This world is the battlefield. This life is the battlefield, and there is never a day that we are going to be able to just stand by and watch it happen. The battle is amongst you. It's all around you. It's in our schools. It's in our hospitals. It's in our government systems. It's in your neighborhood. It's in your home. It's the battlefield, and you got to get you got to get mindful of that. You got to get your mind around it. I've come here today to ask the question: Whose side are you on? It's time to let God know that you're on His side. It's time to let the kingdom of darkness know that I'm on God's side. I'm a child of God. His flag is in my heart. His flag has proven itself as to take dominion over my life in the work of salvation. It's that flag that you wave today. It's time to let your enemy know whose side you're on. You need to let somebody know that he's not just the God of the stars who is out there somewhere in this unattainable, unattouchable atmosphere, but he's the God who sticks closer than a, than a brother. He's a God who took the stripes for us personally so that we could finally be freed from the work of sin and death. He's a personal Savior, but yet at the same time, he's the God of all the universe. How is it possible? That's the mystery of godliness. It's the mystery of who he is, that the God of all creation would know who I am, and I could converse with him on a one-on-one -on -one level, just telling God, Lord, I'm having a tough day today, or God, I'm so thankful that you've been just so faithful and so good to me. How I'm so undeserving of your blessing. You could just tell God whatever it is you want to tell him today, because God's got his ear tuned into this place this morning. God's ear is leaning in our direction today and you could tell God whatever it is you want to tell him today if you knew you had five minutes with the maker of all creation what would you say to him you can do that right now you've got his attention today all you have to do is just tell him what's what's on your heart you need to let him know what's what you're dealing with this morning there's got to be some kind of response that comes from us I think that's really what is a test. It's a litmus test that declares whose side you're on. Sometimes we get confused. Sometimes we get misplaced in our loyalties, I guess I should say. But there comes a time where you just, you got to do something. You got to take action. What does taking action look like for a believer? I'm glad you asked me that. Sometimes taking action on a believer's part means you don't just stand there with your hands in your pockets, but you actually get your hands out and start using them. Or maybe you stand up and you just start taking a walk, a praise walk, Maybe you take a lap for the first time in your life around the church. Maybe you open your mouth and let your praise out. The, let that vocalization happen. What, what, what are you doing? Whenever you do that, it's the last thing that the kingdom of darkness wants to ever see from you. 
is a response, a declaration of faith. Whenever you do those things, what you're doing is you're putting the flag up in your life whenever you lift that hand. You're putting the flag up whenever you lift your voice. You're putting the flag up whenever you demonstrate in praise unto God and in prayer. There's something that happens whenever we demonstrate what it is we believe in. And it's something that happens whenever we demonstrate whose side we are on. We are on God's side. And one of the hardest truths that we can face in this life is simply this all we have to do to be lost is to do nothing all you got to do to be lost is just do don't do anything at all and your human your humanity will lead you to a place where you're going to be lost it is inevitable that's why living for the lord is it takes work it takes action it takes determination it, it's it's like it just take it there's maintenance to it we just recently bought a pool this year. They're a lot of fun, but they're a lot of maintenance. It's a lot of maintenance. If I want that water to be clean, I got to change that filter. I got to check the chemistry of that water. I got to, you know, all these things. You know, last thing I want to do is be out there first thing in the morning spraying out some filter, trying to clean all the gunk that has got all that. But here's the thing. Our walk with God is much the same. That if I want to be clean and if I want my water and my life to be right, I'm going to have to put the litmus test to it and say, God, all right, here I am. I know I'm, a, I'm messed up today, but here I am. I need you to put your, your test strip in my life and start to, whatever it is, God, if I got to have some humility here, then put a little humility in my life. If I got to have a little repentance, then Lord, let that happen. There's something that we got to understand about this walk. It takes maintenance. And if you want your water to go bad, just don't do anything at all. But here's the thing. If you don't do anything, there's going to come a day where somebody's going to come over and they're going to want to swim and what water you got. And when you go to work and it just happen to be a day where you, a, a week, a month, that you've kind of done zero maintenance on your spiritual life and they come in and they want to test the spiritual water of your life and your walk with God and they look at what it is that's happening there and it's got all kinds of critters crawling in it and it's got a little a whole bunch of algae growing on the sides and it's a little discolored and cloudy and they look at that and they say hey I thought this was water to swim in Oh, we got to go to the Ezekiel, don't we? Yes, we do. Because there's a reason why you got to keep yourself right with God every single day because you don't know who's coming down the road to your life that wants to test your water. So I guess here's the, the profound question. <laughs> there's no profound question coming from this guy, trust me. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? You know, you use that word, heaven, for heaven's sake. Will you stop that? For heaven's sake. But what are you, on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? What are you doing? What is your position? What is your duty? I'm talking to the youngest person and to the oldest person in the room. Do you have some stars and stripes that you can boast about and wave in your life? And I'm not talking about these colors. I'm talking about his colors. Do you have some of those in your life that you can wave to somebody you work with or somebody you live next to? Maybe there's some family that you're about to spend some time with this afternoon and this evening that you need to do some flag waving to. Maybe there's some strangers that you're going to encounter at the park whenever you sit there and you're watching those fireworks go off. And maybe there's some, some opportunity that God's going to allow you to step into that you can wave some flag for him. Matthew 24, there was a servant with two talents who was called wicked, slothful, and unprofitable. He had two talents and was cast into outer darkness and there was wailing and gnashing of teeth. It was a terrible scene. Not because he didn't have ten talents and not because he didn't have five. He only had two. But the reason there was such a terrible event that befell him was because he did nothing with what he was given. Don't tell me God didn't give you something, didn't have something in mind for you whenever he gave you the Holy Ghost. 
Don't tell me that God didn't have something in mind whenever he washed you in his blood. There is something in you that God wants for his kingdom. God has invested in you because he knows there's something about you that's worth investing for. God wants to get out of you whatever it is that he's put into you. For some of us, God has given us that, those two talents, and I'm just thankful for two. I'm thankful for one. I'm just thankful for anything. But God has given to some of us for who much is given much is required. God has given to some of us 10 talents, 50 talents. He's given you 100 talents of blessing and favor from him, and he is going to require something from you. You got to do something with that. You need to let the devil and the world and the church all know whose side you're on. You need to let every one of those three things know where you stand by the way that you respond today. If I'm preaching about sin or servitude or tithing or heaven or hell, I shouldn't have to become a beggar to try to get you to respond to preaching. I should be able to look behind me, I believe, and see a whole line of people who are getting behind the word of God. I believe in what it is that I'm preaching to you this morning. You let me know whose side you're on whenever you say amen. That's right. You let me know if you agree with what I'm saying by, by your response. Don't make, a, don't, don't make me guess whose side you're on. Come, come to your feet once in a while. Maybe, maybe, maybe clap your hands once on a blue moon. Do, do something. Just say, hey, I'm on God's side too, Pastor. A standard is a flag. It's, sometime, it's sometimes it's something really that people would gather under or follow after during times of war. A standard or a flag is something that represents something. Isaiah 62 and 10. I want to read this for you. Isaiah 62 and 10 says, Go through, go through the gates. Prepare you the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye unto the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out a city not forsaken. The standard you bear says something about you. What standard do people see flying in your life? My God is the God of the stars. He is known for his mighty acts. He is known for his excellent greatness. He is sovereign in his power. We look at the stars and we see that. But he is also the God of our stripes. For the one who created the stars and named them came by a lowly estate and came into our lost and sinful world and bore upon himself the chastisement of our peace. And by his stripes we are healed today. That, my friend, friend is something worth celebrating that my friend is something to remember that is something to behold let's stand together if you would this morning we are living in dark times there will no be no doubt be news probably today of somebody burning an american flag somewhere not in some foreign country, but probably even on United States soil. There's probably going to be somebody doing some kind of protesting that the USA is some terrible racist nation that is holding everybody down. But the truth is this, is that there is no freer, stronger, or blessed nation on the planet than these United States of America. The grass is not greener on the other side. We're standing on it. The greenest grass that's available, you're standing on it right now. America has its issues, I know. We see the same stuff. We understand that. But it's still the greatest thing going. And it's got God's hand upon it. This country's history 
is full of stories of people who came to this American idea that became an American dream that anyone who comes here can better themselves through their willingness to do so and through hard work. Today, if your ancestors came here by way of Plymouth Rock, Slave Ship, Ellis Island, or some way more recent, we all have the same opportunity right now. Today, to work harder, to prosper, to do what we can to better ourselves and to better our families and our futures. The truth is, it's available to everybody, no matter where you come from, no matter what race, what skin color you are, I know identity politics is saying that you're held down because somebody else's skin is a different color and that's what your problem is. I'm sorry, that's not your problem at all. It's a mind thing. And if you will get in your mind that you can succeed and you will be willing to work hard and do diligently what it is that the opportunity, the American opportunity is set before you, you can succeed. I truly, honestly believe that. But while prosperity is possible... In the midst of all that, dark forces are rising around us. You see the flooding of information through outlets and media and social media and all this thing that it's just this rhetoric all the time of how bad things are. And no doubt the Antichrist is rising in our culture. But I know this, and it's Isaiah 59 and 19. When the enemy shall come in like a flood... The Spirit of the Lord. Amen. It's not something we raise, but this is something God does. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Mm -hmm. yeah. That lets me know that God has a plan. Yeah, things may be getting darker and things are flooding in, but I'm telling you, God in this darkened hour is raising up a standard that is calling the church to arms. That means we got to get ourselves equipped with the armor of God. We got to get that sword of the Spirit in our hand. We got to get that shield of faith out. We got to get ourselves together because there's a lost world that we're not fighting against. There's a lost world that needs us. They deserve to be in our ranks. They deserve to be a part of the army of God and the kingdom of righteousness. I'm here to tell you that God has a plan, and there's a great opportunity that has been given to us through the means of this great nation that we celebrate today. It's a blessing to be in America. We won the lottery whenever we were born on the soil. Does anybody believe that? I believe that. And I believe that God is lifting up his standard for the church, especially even the American church, to do what it can do to spread revival and spread the gospel throughout this great world that we live in. I believe God is lifting up his standard for whosoever will gather around his banner of love and power and a sound mind through the work of salvation that comes through his spirit. I'm thankful for what our nation's flag represents. It's an idea. This American idea that was founded upon godly principles that a nation could be under the idea of something greater than itself. That we can somehow manage with that unified, you, you understand the unity that's been lost in America comes all the way back to that founding idea that all kinds of creeds and nationalities and people can come together with this one idea that we're under a maker whose name is Jesus, and he's the one who's in charge of this picture. And if we can agree to that, there's a unification that comes with that. I'm just so thankful to be an American today. And I wonder this morning, if you've been touched by the stars and stripes of heaven, you should definitely be thankful for the stars and stripes that we celebrate here today. Because there's a direct correlation, there's a direct connection between what America is and the salvation that we experience. And I hope I've kind of shed light on that a little bit. We're going to close out with some songs this morning. Sister Becky, if you want to go ahead. I'm just thankful to be part of this picture, part of this great nation that I believe has the potential to turn its face toward the the Lord. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles 
that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, God's going to hear that, and he's going to heal our land. I believe that is possible today. Let's sing for a second. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of the wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. What else you got? Let's get patriotic. Come on now, somebody. I'm very thankful for this nation. I'm thankful for this flag and what it represents. So I think it's good for us to sing God Bless America. America needs a work of a release of a work of righteousness into it. Amen. Let's sing together. God bless America. Uh,
Hallelujah. Why don't you right now, let's say a prayer for America this morning. Can you just ask God to heal our nation, to speak to our country? Lord, I commit this great nation. I commit its leadership. Lord, every system of government, Lord, that is under the auspices of this flag. I pray, Lord, for our country. I pray, Lord, for our people. I pray for every kindred and nation and tongue that is represented under our, our country's flag today. I pray, Lord, for the 50 states. I pray, Lord, that every, Lord, territory of the United States would be blessed. I pray, God, that you would release a work of righteousness and healing into our land. Lord, that we could have the love of God about us. Lord, that we could see and feel, Lord, your fingerprints upon every aspect of our being. Lord, you are the creator of the universe. You are the one that is the author and the finisher. I pray, God, that you would author a healing work into our country today. Lord, that you would write it into the annals of history. Lord, that this year was a year of healing. I pray, God, that you would turn this country's face towards you. Lord, let us be mindful of our blessing. Let us be mindful of the prosperity and the potential of possibility that has been laid at our feet. Lord, because of your great kindness kindness to us. Lord, I thank you for your hand of protection. Lord, I thank you for keeping us. Lord, even in dark hours, Lord, let the light of the gospel pierce the darkness. Lord, let it push back the darkness. Let the love and the spirit of God lift up that standard, Lord, that we can gather to. Lord, that we would be gathered as a church, Lord, triumphantly. I trust you, Jesus, to accomplish your perfect purpose and will. Let your name, Jesus, be glorified. Lord, from the mountains to the prairie to every ocean on every cor corner of our continent, God, that you would do the work that needs to be done. Let your name, Jesus, be exalted, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone say amen. amen. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. God bless you. I love you. I appreciate you. Be safe. Be kind. Let your flag, your personal flag of salvation fly today. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Don't forget prayer meeting on.